Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And this is an STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case with one of our biggest guests. A big welcome to Brian Enton. He is News Nation's senior national correspondent. He's an Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist. Brian most recently worked as a reporter for WSVN in Miami, which is a stone's throw away from where we are both at. And uh, while at SVN, Brian covered uh, hurricanes, uh, including Dorian from the Bahamas and every other story you can imagine. And then he went over to News Nation, and there was a story, the Gabby Petito case, which blew the doors off the collective true crime community and really put Brian Enton on the map. And for that, uh, he got a ton of much-deserved recognition, and he is here to four one of the most sought after and uh, highly respected true crime reporters. Brian, welcome. How are you? Wow, what an introduction. I mean, God, (laughs) this made my head so big. I'm I'm so sought after. You know, it's just like your wife texting me like, we need you to do a podcast. (laughs) That's a COE. She's always on it. So for full disclosure, believe it or not, we did not get into true crime until – the Koberger case, uh, which was just a year ago, November. Prior to that, it was just my mom and I yapping. But of course, I'm a news guy, so I've always paid attention to things. But the Gabby Petito case, I was busy with uh, some things with my own media company at the time, and I I really didn't follow it. But I did. It's this is funny. I do remember like when this story first broke, and Ileana, I think at the time was still working at News Nation. And she said, my friend Brian is covering this. And I went there. And uh, I think Brian Etten had about 2,000 Twitter followers at that time. And uh, if you go and look at Brian Etten's Twitter page today, it's uh, well over 300,000, I believe. So that case, everyone really started to look to you, Brian, for information. So so take us back. You're, you're a new reporter at this new uh, fledgling cable news network. Um, is this 20, I don't even know, is this 2021 now? Um, how does this all start to evolve? Yeah, this would have been, it all is kind of a blur. Yeah, like 2021, you mentioned I was working for the Fox station in Miami, um, like doing investigative, you know, South Florida news. And I, you know, I covered a lot of crime, obviously, in Florida, but not, I wasn't really like into true crime or, I mean, you know, I knew about the big cases, but it wasn't like, my thing or anything. And, um, I got sent to, they basically like the boss is called. I had started at news nation and they said, you know, there's this missing young woman. Um, her, you know, boyfriend showed back up in Northport, Florida, which is like three hours or so from Miami. Um, and why don't you guys just drive over there and, you know, we don't really know what this story is, but you know how it begins, Joel. Like, just like, you know, I thought we'd be there like one or two days. My first reaction was like, you know, hopefully she was going to be found safe. I actually thought like maybe this was some kind of, it's weird. My first thing was like, maybe this is a social media hoax because these two young kids were trying to, you know, get social media followers. And I really didn't think like, I just thought it was, you know, I'd be there for like a night or two and hopefully it would all get resolved. And I just thought it was going to be like any other story. So we drove over there. And by the way, uh, they told my wife to drive over there and I never heard the end of it. You wanted me to take a job in national news and they think that they think that Northport's five minutes from Miami and it's a three hour drive. And I was like, listen, I remember that. Yeah, she I think (laughs) came over a couple times. I remember maybe once or twice. But I, you know, she with the kids and everything, she was like, I can't, you know, she couldn't. I can't do this. Yeah. So that's my life. That's my life, Brian. So you go up there. Uh, there's this guy, Brian Laundry, not spelled like laundry, but close enough. And there's obviously Gabby Petito. And what do you know at the time that they were on this cross country trip? Right. And uh, and then you heard that he, like you said, it headed back to Northport, Florida. So you go uh, tell me a little bit. What was your first impression, by the way, of Northport, Florida? A lot of times as reporters, we get sent places and they're kind of like, 
hole in the wall sort of place, you know, places, you, you know, but what was your first impression when you got there? Yeah, it's kind of like this random Florida town outside Tampa. Um, like, it, you know, it, it's just like a normal, you know, Florida suburb, like, you know, the, the neighborhoods, they've got the canals. Um, there really wasn't anything that like unique about it. Um, so it was really hot though. I remember that it was like a really hot time of year. So it was like swampy and muggy. Uh, mm -hmm. and we got over there and we were really like one of the first, um, like news crews to be out there. I think there was like maybe another local station, but there wasn't really any national attention yet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we went to the laundry's house, you know, just, I, I just assumed like it was going to be, you know, they, that they were going to come out and there was going to be like, you know, interviews that they were going to be looking for Gabby. And, um, I don't think I was that suspicious of Brian Laundry at that point. I don't think I knew what to think. I just kind of went with an open mind. Um, mm -hmm. and when we got there, like pretty quickly, I realized like there was something a little strange, like the parents, um, Chris and Roberta, like were kind of like held up in the house. Like they wouldn't come out. We had been knocking on the door um, and they didn't want to talk to us. And you could just get a vibe from the police, too, that like, you know, this might have been a little more serious than I first thought. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Gabby Petito's parents were in New York. We had a reporter up in New York and talking to them. And they had then, you know, had been trying to get the police to, you know, take the case seriously. And they were having trouble getting in touch with the with Brian's parents and, you know, they had all known each other previously. So that kind of seemed a little strange. Like why would Brian's parents be ignoring Gabby's parents? So I think within like the first day of being there, I realized um, like, this isn't going to be what I thought, like just a quick, you know, that she's going to be found. Okay. And we'll move on to the next thing. I, I kind of realized like there were more things happening behind the scenes. Yeah. And by the way, shout out news. People don't realize is a team effort. You're there with Luis, your photographer. Can't forget yeah. about Luis. So he's with you side by side. Cause I remember watching that and uh, you guys would always have a great vantage point from the neighbor's yard. Uh, yeah. I think you guys got permission and you were always kind of like on the side angle. Uh, that's also the world didn't know Jennifer Koffendoffer back then. She was all over. We just interviewed Jennifer for surviving my biggest case. So I know you kind of mentored her in the news world back then, but Jennifer Koffendoffer also became kind of a pretty well-known name uh, yeah. during that case. So, so you're in Northport and, and when, um, how far into this do you start? Cause now we all know about these videos that we see uh, from Utah, I believe it is. Uh, when did, when did all of that, start to unfold where you learn about this cross country trip and this, you know, possible, you know, abuse or harassment. Uh, when does that all start to, to fall? Well, apart? we saw Gabby's videos right away. Um, cause we found her social media. So we knew that she was, you know, trying to create like a travel blogger presence. And we, you know, we, we saw the videos of them together in terms of like the Moab body camera video and kind of realizing that there was a domestic violence situation happening. Like we didn't realize that for probably like at least a week or so. Uh, but you mentioned Luis. Yeah. My cameraman, like I worked with him in my previous job. So he was with me and, you know, news nation was so new then and we're still really new, but we like really didn't have a lot of resources. Like we didn't have a field producer. We didn't have really anyone helping us. It was just me and Luis there. And Jennifer, it's kind of a funny story. Um, they wanted to book like a former FBI agent to come out and help us, you know, with coverage and stuff. And there was this other guy who I'm friends with who I really wanted to come and he couldn't come. Like he had a trial or something. And I was so disappointed. And I was like trying so hard. And they're like, oh, there's this lady, Jennifer Koffendoffer, that we found. Like she lives in Jacksonville. And I was like, I don't even know who this lady is. I really want the other guy. Like I know him. He'll be great. And he just like, I'm so sorry, I cannot do it. So I'm like, okay, well, like send the Jennifer lady. Like I had no idea. <laughs> and she rolls up, like we're in this, you know, with the laundry's neighborhood, it's like so random. And it's again, hot and there's like this ditch and it's swampy and there's water. And she like rolls up in this Jag convertible 
And I don't know if you've met Jen. Have you met Jennifer in person? Yeah, I met her. I met her at CrimeCon. Yeah, she's so sweet. Cute little woman. She's got her blonde hair. She's so tiny. She gets out of this Jag convertible. And like, I was like, oh my God, I I loved her from the second (laughs) I saw her. And she like had a little salad that she got at Wendy's or something. And she's like, I'll just get in the car with you guys. So she like got in the backseat and she was eating her salad. And like, you know how it is with news people. Like I immediately knew I'm like, okay, she's like, she fits in with us. Like she's 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 cool, you know, and then we yeah. friends out. And she can she can also kill you, by the way. She's like a firearms instructor, oh, yeah. self defense. She yeah. can kill me with her, just like her hands. Like she knows, <laughs> like how to like just kill people. Like, yeah. like you know, so, so crazy. So yeah. let me ask you this. Well, real, just give us like a a one second primer, aka primer, on this story for those who don't know, because not everyone knows the story. But essentially. It's Gabby, who's from Long Island, and you've got Brian Laundrie from Northport. And they're they're what? They're on a, a cross-country trip here? Just fill in the blanks. Yeah, so little. they had been dating for a while, and Gabby was living in Florida with Brian and his parents. Um, and they had been saving to go on this cross-country road trip, like van life, which is like a thing. Like you save up, you buy a van, like a cargo van, which is what they did. And then you kind of trick it out on the inside, like a little bedroom. So they had done all of that themselves, built out the van. Um, and they were, you know, blogging, they had great videos and they were going on this like amazing cross-country road trip. So they went, you know, all the way across the country. They were in Utah and Wyoming. Um, and, uh, it was supposed to be like this incredible thing. And then, you know, to make a long story short, Brian Laundry shows up back in Florida in the van without Gabby. And that's sort of what sparked the whole thing. And then it all kind of unraveled from there. You know, unfortunately, Gabby was found dead. Brian Laundry killed her and, uh, and, you know, then killed himself later. So when, how far, how far along into it? Uh, do you find out that um, that Gabby has has been murdered? How many how many days are you there? It was a long way. I mean, we thought she was alive. Um, like I don't remember the exact number of days, but I mean, it was most of the time in the beginning. Um, like she wasn't found, so you know, we there was a whole search for her for a long time. Um, and then he went missing, which like was really crazy. Cause we, what we were outside the house all the time. And you mentioned we were in the neighbor's yard. So basically like more and more media started to show up. Like it became a very popular story and all the networks started showing up. And then you had all the local stations and local stations from Miami too. And there was no sidewalk or anything in this neighborhood. So people were blocking the road and basically the police were like, everybody has to leave. Um, mm. Like you can't block the road anymore. So we may had become friends with the neighbors and like none of the neighbors liked the laundry. So it kind of like that helped, you know, mm-hmm. and for us. And because they, why, why did they like them? What, what was their reasoning? what did they tell you? Well, the neighbors that we became friends with had these two pugs, like these super cute pugs. And they said the laundries like didn't like their dogs. So that was like an issue, you know? Yeah. If you don't uh, like pugs, something is wrong. Yeah, with you. of course. Which was like kind of was like a little weird that they didn't like them because they were like really sweet pugs. Yeah. Um, so we became friends with them, like just because you know you're out there all the time. And so mm-hmm. when they kicked us all off the street, and there was literally we all like people had to go to the police station to go live. You were nowhere near where you needed to be. We worked out a deal with them, and we really liked them that we would pay them. Um, and I can't remember we paid them weekly to stay in their grass. Cause like we were killing their grass and like, and also mm-hmm. like, you know, it was news nation's money and I really liked them. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> let's help these people out, you know? Um, so we would get cash and we would, and the, the husband worked, um, like a, a really early job. I think he was a painter and he would leave at like four in the morning. So we had barely saw him. So we would like leave cash under this little like duck. This, they had like a little concrete duck by their front door. So we would leave the cash every week. And then in exchange, we got to basically camp out on their lawn, which is how we had that vantage point, which I think really annoyed the laundries because we would go like right up to the property line and yeah, right by the yeah. door. And like, there was really nothing they could do. And the police couldn't kick us out either. Cause we, you know, had permission from the, the neighbors. Mm, that that's uh, a little inside baseball when it comes to uh, reporting. So you start to learn obviously that, the potatoes and the laundries, there's this, this weird disconnect. And then, um, you get 
word how do you find out ultimately that gabby has been murdered how do you how do you get wind of that do you remember what you were doing at that point yeah i remember we were out there and there um there was word that they were searching in teton um and that her parents had gone out there and that they found um a body and so immediately you know they they weren't confirming i remember we were calling the coroner and trying to get confirmation and they weren't confirming it was her but i mean you know how it is like you sort of get this sense that mm-hmm. that, that that it was going to end up being her um and but it's such it's such a you know out west is so much different than you know the northeast so how how were they able to track her down how were they able to locate the body it's just this vast wilderness out there so there was this blogger so it basically like I mean, you were saying you were kind of working on your business. So you weren't really following it, but like it became this really intense story, like that everybody was focused on, like around the country, like it, looking for Gabby. Mm-hmm. Um, and people, because they had so many social media posts, and you know they were checking in places, and even like their song playlists were online. Like people were really digging into their social media presence, trying to like see if they could figure out if that had any clues. Um, And there was these bloggers, this family of bloggers that had been in Grand Teton and had like a dash cam on their van um, that was just rolling like as part of their blog. And they went back and looked through their dash cam footage and actually spotted Gabby's van on the side of this. And I, I later went out there. It's like in the middle of nowhere on the side of this dirt road in Grand Teton National Park. Mm-hmm. Um, they alerted the police like, you know, hey, back on this date, because they had the date and everything from, you know, from their, their dash cam, that we think this is her van. So that's that's how they found figured out where the van had been. And then where Gabby's body was found was, I don't know, maybe like a quarter of a mile from some of the van. So they were just like searching in that area based on um, the tip from the bloggers. What what do you think it was about this story that literally captivated the nation? I mean, it captivated people around the world. Do you think it's because there were were these videos? It's a pretty young woman. Um, what what were the sort of the ingredients that made this such a compelling story for everyone? Yeah, that's a good question. It's it's interesting. I was talking to Gabby's parents about that like recently. Like even they still were trying to figure out like what made our story like so mm-hmm. big. Um, It's hard to say. I mean, I think I think the main thing is just like Gabby's presence, like people just felt, uh, including me, felt like a connection to her. Like she just had this, you know, because you could see her in the videos and she would talk and she just had this like really peaceful, nice, wonderful personality that you just immediately felt like I've always wondered, like if she wasn't murdered, like would she have ended up being some kind of like celebrity or something like because she just had that quality about her that you wanted to like get to know her. So I think that was part of it. Also the fact that they had all these videos, like for people like me who were covering the story, I mean, it made it really easy to have people connect to because you had like, you know, you had all these videos like of them together that were really well edited and well shot. And, you know, it wasn't like covering a missing case where it's like a family member gives you two photos. I mean, you had like a whole library of, and then I think also just as more came out, about the domestic violence and about Brian Laundry just like seeming like this nice guy, but having this dark side that you could kind of see when you knew what to look for. Like, I think people connected to that too, just because there's so many, so many people have been in a bad relationship where the, you know, the, the significant other seems like a nice person, but like, you know, there's all these signs. And I think people like felt a connection to that. Like, you know, you, you could kind of um, relate to that in a way. So I think that's, that's maybe why. And how did how did Brian and Gabby get together? How did they come together? They had known each other for a while. I think they were I'm trying to remember if they were in high school together at one point or they had mutual friends. Um, and they, I mean, they were. It was kind of murky about whether they were actually engaged or whether he just asked her. And she, we don't really know because um, at one point we we're saying engaged, and then some people were saying no, they weren't actually engaged. But they had been together, and then they basically had this dream of, um, you know, doing the road trip. And so she moved in with his parents so that they could save money. Um, and you know, they were, they were working towards that, but it, you know, I think that Gabby, again, just like having that, she was so beautiful on the inside and out. She, 
I think he was very like possessive of that, like, you know, afraid of losing her and kind of like, it was kind of an unhealthy relationship in that way. Like, especially as she started doing more of the blogging, you know, she was getting attention. And I think he just seems like sort of wanted her all for himself kind of thing. And, uh, when we're, um, sorry, I'm just, when we're, so you talked about this, when, when was the first, um, indication that there was this dark side to Brian? When do we start to find that out? So, well, so Gabby was missing. Um, and then the weird, like when it really took a turn was we, the police were telling us that they had eyes on Brian Laundry and that he was in the house with his parents, um, mm -hmm. while they, everyone was searching for Gabby. So that's what we assumed, which is really the reason we wanted to stay outside the house. Like, was he going to come out? Was he going to get arrested? Um, so we were outside the house all the time thinking he was inside. And then all of a sudden, like police randomly tell us that like, they don't know where Brian Laundry is anymore, which didn't make any sense. Cause it was like, but you said he was in the house, like, and you have eyes on him. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of like a big turning point. Like now, not only is Gabby missing, but Brian Laundry is also missing. And it was like, there's something really, really weird going on. Um, okay. And I remember, I remember the video, you know, periodically you would see the laundry father or the parents getting into that pickup truck and leaving. I, I know you guys would, would, you know, yell questions to them. W would they just completely ignore you and just do their thing and leave? Yeah, they would ignore us totally, which like, again, was kind of like a weird vibe. Like if now your son is also missing, um, like, why wouldn't you want to come out and be like, please help us find Brian, help us find Gabby. Cause that's what Gabby's parents were doing. And they were just like, they would barely ever leave. But like at one point, I think it was, I forget, like it felt like weeks had gone by where they hadn't come out. Their grass was like so tall, like they weren't mowing the grass. Like they were just like totally shut in. Um, but when they would come out, we would yell questions. We would follow them sometimes to see where they were going. Um, like, I just became, I don't know, it was weird. Like I became really obsessed with the situation and um, like, I even looking back sometimes I'm like, did I go too far? Like Luis and I would like follow them wherever they would go basically. Like uh -huh. to Publix, to, just to see, cause like we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if they were going to see Brian, what was happening. Um, right. so, so yeah, it just became kind of more and more suspicious. And there was sort of like rumblings that maybe it was an abusive relationship between Brian and Gabby. But then we found out about the traffic stop in Moab, Utah that had happened. And mm -hmm. we were able to get the body camera video. And when they released that video, that was when it was like very clear, like that there was a whole nother side to Brian and Gabby's relationship that no one, um, like that we didn't know about until when the video came out, it was like crystal clear, like, okay, like he's abusing her. This is super messed up. Like, you know, this is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Talk about, uh, cause you just mentioned it. Like you'd follow them to Publix. What's it like for people who don't know to sort of like ride a massive story. And you, you really own this story. Um, you were the kind of the go-to guy on this. Uh, what, what kind of, I guess, added pre did you feel added pressure uh, what was it like for you personally to be covering this and to make sure that you continue to own the story as it developed? Yeah, I mean, I felt pressure because people were so invested in it. And um, like, I felt uh, just like sad. I remember when they released that body camera footage, like I hadn't gone home in probably like a month because we were just on the story all the time. And, you know, I mean, you know how it is, like these other networks have like, by that point, you know, massive crews out there i mean like an nbc you know there's like the dateline crew and you know we're up yeah. against it's like literally just me and louise up against these like you know big networks so i just i didn't want to miss anything but you know we were also like camping out on the lawn like you know they would go back to their like fancy hotel and like you know do their network thing and louise and i were just like you know, I think that's one of the reasons we were kind of owning it just because we were really like grassroots with the whole thing. Like we, you know, we weren't really sleeping or anything, but no, there was definitely pressure. There was um, like so many people were interested and started following me. So I felt like I wanted to do a good job. And, and also like yeah. I was starting to get to know Gabby's parents um, at yeah. the time and just sort of like a feeling that you didn't want to disappoint them. You wanted to cover the story respectfully because their daughter 
you know, was missing and then was found dead. Um, and did, had you reached out to them prior to them finding the body or was this all after they found the body? Do you remember how, and how, you know, what was your, one of your first conversations I'm with them? I don't remember. Um, I don't remember exactly when I first reached out, but we were in communication. And then I was also, you know, the laundries had this lawyer, Stephen Bertolino, who was very, very um, engaging. Like they wouldn't talk to us, but once we found out about the lawyer, like I was always in touch with him too. So it was just this constant, like trying to stay in touch with people. Um, and I remember like I was doing really well, like in terms of just like being on it and not getting emotional. But like when the body cam video came out, I don't know, I think I had just hit a wall. Um, like it was so sad, like seeing her and just, like I said, that was a moment where like everything kind of came into like clear vision of what, what was happening in their relationship. And I remember I was doing a live, a Twitter live, and I got kind of like emotional and kind of like angry about mm. the whole situation. And that was like the one time I was like, okay, like I remember going home that weekend because it was just, I mean, you know how it is. Like sometimes you just like kind of hit a breaking point. You need a little reset, you know? Yeah. You need a break. Yeah. A hundred percent. So um, this obviously is going on for, for weeks, if not months, uh, you find the, you know, the, that her, you know, they discover her body, by the way, there was a whole other weird thing. Uh, this story had like other tentacles. Wasn't there like a couple that was missing in Utah as well around the same time, whatever happened to that? Yeah, there was a couple and people were, were trying to connect it thinking that maybe Brian Laundrie had something to do with it. It ended up having nothing to do with it. Like there was another man who ended up being um connected to that killing of, of these two women and then i think he and I, I don't remember all the details but he ended up i think being like committing suicide or dying or something mm -hmm. but there was a time where i mean there were all sorts of crazy connections and conspiracy theories and i mean when brian went missing you know we thought he was on the appalachian trail for a while and there were all these spottings of him like all over the country so mm -hmm. it was hard like just staying on top of it every day, like, cause there were so many new tips coming in. Um, and we, you know, we didn't really know like what was true, what wasn't. And then the story kind of shifts towards like this, uh, I, to this, I don't know if it's a national, not a national park, but a, maybe a Florida state park, like that's very swampy. Uh, yeah. what's that all, what's that all about? Where was that? And why did everything shift over there? So basically they had found Gabby um, and Brian was still missing. And, you know, like I said, there were all sorts of spottings of him and people thought he was in Mexico. People thought he was in Canada. Um, but the police were very insistent that they were only going to search really this, this preserve is called the Carlton um, Preserve, which was like about 15 minutes from his parents' house. And it's just like this big national wildlife preserve, like very Florida, swampy, kind of Everglades-ish. Um, like, you know, a lot of like uh, wetlands, alligators, snakes, but there were some like hiking trails there. And, um, you know, we come to find out later, but like Brian's parents were telling the police, like, we're pretty sure that's where he is. We're, we're, we're almost positive, like that's where, and they had found his car out there, which we later found out. So they were totally focused. So we would spend our days like starting at the house and then we would race over to the preserve every day like if we got a tip. But it was it was hard. We went up in a helicopter one day, but it was hard really to like manage covering the preserve search just because it was so big and they were on airboats and, you know, in helicopters. And so it wasn't like you could just sit in one spot and really know what was going on. Um, That's also got to be miserable because wasn't this in the summer and you yeah, got to be getting miserable. eaten alive by mosquitoes, right? I mean, this yeah, and there was no cell phone service like out there. So yeah. it was, like getting a live shot was hard and like telling people, you know, even to tweet. I remember I had like my hotspot and I'd like put it on top of the car and I could barely like, you know, you could get like a tweet out. But like I, yeah. I remember doing uh, not to interrupt, but I just did. But yeah. I remember doing a live shot. So I was at. CBS in Miami FOR two different times, but my first go around was the mid two thousands, and I was doing a live shot at the Everglades, and I'm done with a live shot, and I had a female photographer who was awesome, and she's like, "Joel, come to me very slowly," and I look back, and there's a friggin' alligator. Oh, on the so yeah. scary, so yeah. scary. So you, that's life. something people don't get. Like you're dealing with the elements out there. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was hot. It was pretty miserable out there. Mosquitoes. Luis was such a trooper again, cause it was just, 
me and him. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. We would just go to the, we would go to the house and then we would go to the swamp like every day. I think that went on for like another three weeks. And um, did you ever, did you ever, um, get any sort of definitive word whether or not he was ever actually in the house? Had he ever been in the house? Yeah. So he had been there, um, at one point apparently, but somehow like left and the police didn't know. Um, and you know, they ended up finding us. It was really, there was a lot of issues with the police and like the way that they, I mean, granted, come to find out when I was all over, you know, Gabby was already dead. Um, there really wasn't, you know, Brian Laundrie ended up killing himself. So, I mean, it's not like anything the police would have done differently could have saved Gabby's life in terms of the Florida police. But it was still just like kind of, cr- I remember when they said Brian Laundrie is not in the house and we don't know where he is. It was like this crazy moment because you know, for weeks we were told he was in the house, that they had eyes on him. Wow. So what did, as a, as a, like the news crews and you, what did, when you hear that he's not in the house and we don't know where he is, which way did you guys turn? Did you just stay at the house to try to wait on, you know, word about what happened? Yeah. I mean, that, it just became a much bigger story at that moment. And I remember we were, we were going to the Northport police department a lot, like trying to kind of hammer them with questions like, well, how did you lose him? Um, and again, I had like, because we were there all the time, I had like become friends with all the neighbors. So the neighbor in the back behind their house, the police had actually put cameras in his trees, like a whole like mobile unit thing, secret cameras to keep an eye on the back of the house when they thought Brian Laundry was in the house to make sure that if he snuck out the back, they would know. Mm-hmm. Um, so even then, I remember going running over to the neighbors. Like, did, did he leave? Like, did you, did you did the police come? Like, but no. Like, he apparently had just driven away. Like, they thought they thought that Brian Laundry come to find out Roberta, the mom. They thought Brian was Roberta. Like, it was crazy. Mm-hmm. He was able to get away because they thought he was the mom. Like, it was so strange. Wow. So now, when he goes missing, uh, are the parents? continue to remain quiet and as you said they lawyered up right so they they still weren't talking once he went missing is that right yeah they never spoke they still haven't spoke um and yeah they they lawyered up and everything was just like you know statements coming through the lawyer which were kind of like cryptic like it was never just like we're so upset help but you know what i mean it was like you could tell like everything was well thought out through through their lawyer and so what made everyone think, well, he might be in this kind of Everglades-esque reserve nearby? What made people start looking there? Well, the police were were insistent that that's where they had intel that that's where he was. And like mm-hmm. I mean, they had all sorts of resources, FBI, the local police, Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, and they had a ton of resources. So like it, we didn't know at the time later to find out like the parents told the police like that's probably where he was that his car was found there um but at the time like we were kind of skeptical like why are they putting so much effort on this one area um but that is where he ended up being found so you know made sense and uh when they find him he's got a what a bullet hole to the head he shot himself yeah he shot himself um and the way he was found was really weird um like shout out do you know mike ruiz from fox yeah, I do. He's a great, great yeah. uh, reporter, true he's, crime report, digital a, reporter. He's amazing. Um, yeah. And he's my friend too. But shout out to him. Like we, that's how we met out covering Gabby Petito. And, and it was like kind of me and him in terms of like, he was like kind of just sticking around out there too and like not sleeping and stuff. And mm-hmm. he actually followed one early morning, the laundries went to the preserve on their own and a detective followed them. And they were just going out to search on their own. And it was also strange. It was the parents who found the, the remains, who found like Brian Laundrie's backpack and stuff right off of one of the trails, which was so weird because at that point, the police had been searching with all these resources for weeks, but it, it ended up being Remember gone. that. Was, yeah. what, and was there anything ever to that? Like, did they have information? We don't know, right? We we don't know. Know. It was another one of those weird things. Like, there's this massive search with dogs and everything you can imagine, and the parents go out there one random morning, and they're like, oh, we found him. You know? It's yeah. like... So, so, so random. You'd have to yeah. think that he's like... And and don't they later find some sort of, for lack of a better term, the media always uses this, some kind of like, not a manifesto, but some sort, did they find a note or some yeah. writings of his? They found a notebook um, 
which was wet. I mean, this was, it had rained and, you know, the water levels were high and then low. So the notebook was wet and we knew they found the notebook, but we didn't know what was in the notebook. Um, and then later, you know, we were able to get the pages, like, I think it was the FBI that released them, or maybe it was, um, I can't remember how we got them. It might've been Gabby's parents. Um, but that's where he like confessed in the, in the notebook. And so he does, he confesses to everything. He said, does he, he admits to killing her in that notebook? Yes, but it was really messed up. Like he basically said that, um, and I can't remember the exact details right now, but basically that I think that she was hurt and that it was almost like a mercy killing. Like when they were out, um, you know, camping that she somehow hurt herself and then, and he wanted to put her out of her misery kind of thing. But like, there was no evidence that obviously that any of that was true based on like the medical examiner reports. And, you know, it was just, it, it was BS, but that's kind of the way he explained it. Wow. Um, so as you said, the laundry parents have still n- never spoken, but you're in pretty close touch, I think with uh, Gabby Petito's parents. I know I saw you at Crime Con. Uh, Gabby's parents were there. How are they doing today? Yeah, I think they're doing okay, um, considering everything they've been through. They're like, that was just another interesting part of covering this. Like, you don't meet a lot of people like them. Like, they're just such incredible people. And I know, like, we say that about a lot of people, but I really mean it with them because it's just the fact that her parents were divorced and both have like these amazing new spouses but like the whole family's really close like even before this like they're all really good friends um and they're just all such nice people uh and you know i think they still struggle obviously um but you know they've started a foundation and they're really passionate about um like other missing people and helping them their families and also domestic violence and like they've passed laws in several states you know to help with domestic violence situations and prevent things that went wrong in Gabby's situation. So I think they're trying to funnel their, you know, grief into something that they can try and make a difference. So they're doing pretty well considering, you know, everything they've been through, but I'm sure, you know, with people, you have to wonder like, you know, when they're alone behind the scenes, I mean, I think it's probably something you never really, you know, get over obviously. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a horrific story, and then um, not we're not going to get into it, but obviously, uh, about a year later, you end up uh, in Moscow, Idaho. In terms of magnitude, how do you compare the murders in Moscow, Idaho, the four college students by the accused killer Brian Koberger? In terms of the magnitude and scope of the story, how do you compare it to something like Petito, which also got a ton of attention? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's hard, like you said, to compare the two. I think, I mean, they're both just people feel such a connection to both cases. Um, Like, for me, like, I wasn't really into true crime or anything until just randomly covering, getting sent to cover Petito. So um, I just kind of look at them all as, like, stories. Like, I was intense with my stories, you know, that weren't true crime before Petito. So I don't, to me... I just kind of go at it the same way. So it's hard to say like which the magnitude, which one people were more interested in. But I think with both cases, like people felt a connection to Gabby. And then with Koberger's case, people really feel a connection to the victims. And just the fact that they were so innocent and college kids. So I think with both, it's like people feel very invested for sure. Yeah. News is interesting. Uh, one thing I never, ever wanted to cover was politics, but then, uh, good old Roger Ailes sent me to DC and suddenly I'm in the middle of Washington, DC. Uh, and I have to tell you, I did not really love it at first, but, um, I sort of grew to, you know, politics is almost like sport in this country. So a lot, a lot of times what I don't think people get is that we don't pick and choose our stories. You know, there's an assignment desk and we get, uh, told basically what to cover and you can approach it in very similar ways, but what is it like now? Because people do know you now as a true crime reporter, you know, you're a keynote speaker at crime con. What's it like to uh, carry that weight on your shoulders, Brian Enton? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like more of a responsibility to, um, you know, do a good job, not make mistakes, make sure all my facts are right. Um, like I don't want to disappoint people who have followed me, because of some of these cases, you know, and 
So I'm, I'm a little paranoid about that kind of stuff, but you know, I, I still like covering other stories too. Like I still don't consider myself just a true crime reporter. Like I just, I don't know, like what, I just like to cover whatever interests me. Like I just did a whole thing in South Dakota on preppers and mm-hmm. I've been doing all these stories on China buying farmland. And I, you know, I always kind of come back to like the murders and stuff. Cause I don't know why, like that does kind of seem like it's become my thing in a weird way, but um, I like covering other stuff too. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of weird how I fell into this sort of true crime space, but the people are so nice and it's been like such a welcoming community. I I think you felt that too. Like, um, it definitely has like a community feel to it. Um, and it's nice to feel part of that. And like with the presidential stuff kicking up, like, I really don't like politics. Like, I guess you said that too. Like, I'm with you on that. Yeah, um, I don't like wearing a suit. I don't like any of the politicians for the most part. Like, I just think it's boring. I think they all, like, make stuff up. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's never really been, like, I don't really like, like, I don't know. I've never liked interviewing people in suits and ties. Like, it's just always kind of, I'd rather just be, like, out with the real people, you know? I'm with you on that for sure. And it is true. Like the true, I, I never really understood it, but now that I've got this podcast, the true crime community is really tight knit and very thoughtful. That's why I have uh, this sign right here, STS nation. I always say best guest, better community. Um, what's it like uh, these days you're filling in uh, for Dan Abrams, Chris Cuomo, Elizabeth Vargas, some of the biggest names in news, uh, you've made it to the upper echelons. What's it like, Brian, and to be doing yeah. that? Yeah, it's kind of cool. I mean, I still kind of pinch myself. Like, I filled in for Elizabeth Farkas on Friday. Someone I – and, you know, Chris Cuomo, all these people I've always watched. Um, it's cool. I mean, it's cool filling in on the shows because you can um, you can kind of cram a lot into an hour and, like, you know, do a lot of stories that you're interested in without having to, like, fly out to a bunch of places. So that's cool. Um, it's a nice mix. Like, cause you know, with the reporting, which is really like my passion, but you're away from home, you know, you're out in the elements and I love it, but it is nice. Like getting a little break here and there when you fill in, it's a little more like cushy, you know, you're in the studio and you get kind of a, a little bit of a, a, you get to see like the good side, you know, of (laughs) like the, what the, how the, all the, the fancy anchor people live, you know, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, listen, uh, Brian Enton, he used to be at SVN in Miami, but he has made it to the big time. He is News Nation's senior national correspondent, the COE. She worked with him over there, but the COE said, you know what? I'm going to take care of my kids and not drive to Northport, Florida every single day. I thought so, she was going to be on the podcast. She's told me like she might make an appearance. Well, she wants to start her own show. I think we should get her to do that on the channel. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I need she's to get- very funny. I mean... Her she's and I fun. had a connection from the beginning because she's she's a wild one. She is a wild woman, and we will get her on there. And uh, Brian, I don't know if you know this, but I have written a book. Um, you know, the Holocaust, arguably the biggest uh, crime committed against humanity. But I've got a book about my mom, so uh, I'm going to get that into your hands and uh, have you read it and get me your uh, your thoughts on that book. It's going to actually pre-orders are out in, in a couple of weeks and then it hits bookstores on Father's Day. So yeah, um, I would love to, please. Yeah, I would love for you, would love for you to check that out. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Brian Enton, true crime reporter extraordinaire and also just an all around great guy. Thanks for joining us on Surviving My Biggest Case. Till next time.